So in front of you right now, uh, you should be able to see today's program with a very impressive list of speakers. The event will finish at 11.15. Um, so I'll, I'll be responsible for making sure that the, partic the participants, the speakers, don't, um, don't uh, overuse their time. So, so wish me the best of luck. And with all that being said, um, I now have the honor of introducing our host, uh, Jutte Guteland, um, who will open the event. Jutte Guteland will, has been a member of the European Parliament since 2014 and is currently the SD Group's coordinator in the European Parliament's Environment, Public Health and Food Safety Committee. Prior to that, Jutte worked with the think tank Global Utmaning and as a political advisor to the Ministry of Finance in Sweden. For many years, she was the chairperson of the Swedish Social Democrat Youth League. And with that, I leave the word to you, Jutta. Thank you. Thank you, Kalle. And uh, thank you for taking care of also the, the technical things in the beginning. I'm very happy about that. Um, I'm also very happy to host this conference. Honored to, to do that uh, in such a timely uh, um, event, but also important topic. And uh, I, I would like to, both in the beginning and in the end, thank the organization, uh, thing, uh, organizations who, uh, who work with uh, this uh, together with me. Thank you so much. And welcome every one of you who joined this uh, seminar. I know there is a big interest and I'm very happy about it. To talk about cancer can be very difficult. Many of us have lost be beloved ones to these horrible um, diseases. But that is precisely why we need to talk about it more and we need to, to look at the causes of cancer and do things together and become better to protecting the citizens' health. And we can only beat cancer if we look at the uh, root causes of cancer. It's not only about uh, working with medicines, it's absolutely also about talking about what's the big causes. And of course we need to take action also across all the entire spectrum of this disease, starting with how we can best prevent that people develop cancer. And that is why it's so important for Europe also to look at the connection between alcohol consumption and cancer. Because let's face it, in the connection between alcohol intake and cancer, uh, that is not new for us, but already in the 1980s, uh, uh, we saw that the WHO, IR, ARC, um, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, they proved that alcohol beverage are cancerogenic to humans. Um, since then, we have only seen that the understanding for the connection between alcohol and cancer has further developed. And um, um, today we know that alcohol can cause at least seven different types of cancer. We have the knowledge, we have the data, what we lack is actually proper legal framework that also reflects the knowledge into practice. That's what we lack today. Europe has the highest level of alcohol consumption in the world. I probably don't have to say that to all of you who are here today. I know that many of you all have the knowledge. But still, this is really a fact for Europe. This is really something that hurts Europe. But still also, many people in Europe, they are not aware of uh, the link between alcohol and cancer. I often use the example of cigarettes um, and how public opinion is very aware about uh, the, the links between uh, smoking and cancer. And the attitudes to alcohol and cancer is not at all the same. There is no such big knowledge among the citizens. I think um, with the alcohol consumption that we have today, we can safely say that most citizens, they don't know that it's really uh, a bigger risk for, for uh, getting cancer. 
and citizens they have the right to make informed choices that is also a value a principle that i think should should be important for the legislation and also regulation in europe knowledge is the key to make a choice based upon what you think is good for yourself and your family and your health i think that many people want that information they want to know how they can protect themselves because there is a clear um, uh, close um, um, effect uh, between cancer and alcohol i would also say that it's important to know the dose effect that if you drink more then it will also harm you more and uh, that seems very natural but i think people need to be also um, reminded that if uh, the, the, you drink four glasses of wine per day then the risk for getting example for example breast cancer is increasing by 50 percent that is huge so i am not sure that that link is uh, what people and the dose effect that people know that however the dose effect is of course on the reverse uh, uh, effect also you can really change you can minimize uh, the risk from uh, from alcohol by minim by a drink less and um, i would like now to say that when we work in europe against cancer is um, th then we need to take another ambitious step forward uh, uh, and I think that we have the chance with the beating cancer plan and it is high time now to look at what EU and all the member states can do to improve the cancer pro pro protection ag um, uh, across the board in Europe and I know this topic and probably many others uh, will be discussed in this seminar and I um, uh, will be very eager to listen to the suggestions from all the experts. And we will use this hour to do precisely that. We will also have some film uh, that will be shown. Um, and I would like to conclude by saying that it's high time, it is timely, and uh, I really feel uh, more optimistic now when we have the focus on cancer that we will also be able to do the link uh, when it comes to the alcohol consumption. And therefore, I would conclude by saying that I'm grateful to the organizations who uh, have uh, worked with this seminar and uh, helped and collect such an interesting panel so you're all welcome and let's enjoy this together and let's make wise politics suggestions for europe thank you thank you so much uh for an excellent introduction and um whilst we get the next speaker up i can also welcome a, a new a new panelist who will hopefully be joining soon that's why we had some technical issues in the in the start um, and whilst we do that i will uh, introduce our next our next speaker who is um, stefan haas a senior consultant and assistant professor of gastroenterology at the karolinska university hospital in stockholm his main clinical and research focus is alcohol related organ damage including cancer for many years uh, he is representing the professional non-profit organization united european gastroenterology uh, he will give a presentation of alcohol and digestive cancers across Europe. Uh, the floor is yours, Stefan. Thank you very much. Uh, we are very happy that UEG can co uh, contribute. And it's exciting that so many participants are here with us at this webinar. And the next slide, we want to show what uh, was already met. Uh, we will start with a, a brief video. I think this is a good idea to get a, a view of this topic. For many of us, what we drink is a big part of our cultural identity. Europe is famed for its fine beers, spirits, wines and champagne, but it is the heaviest drinking region in the world and levels of consumption are increasing. As a result, Europe also has the highest proportion of ill health and premature death from alcohol in the world. Alcohol is a risk factor in over 60 types of disease, including many digestive cancers such as esophageal, gastric, liver, 
pancreatic, and colorectal cancer. However, up to 90% of people don't associate alcohol consumption with an increased risk of cancer. Now is the time to change our approach to alcohol consumption. EU policymakers need to develop a precise alcohol strategy and enforce regulations relating to alcohol, such as minimum pricing, improved labelling and a ban on TV advertising and sports sponsorship. EU citizens need clear and consistent information to help them understand the cancer risks associated with high alcohol consumption. Together, we have the opportunity to create change and help reduce the number of alcohol-related digestive cancers and deaths across Europe. So thank you. Uh, who are we? Who is OEG? United European Gastroenterology is a non-profit organization combining all the European medical societies and we have more than 30,000 uh, specialists in Europe. And um, we are glad that we can participate, as I said. Next slide. And uh, when we are uh, looking at the global perspective, then you can see uh, Europe is compared to other regions, really the world champion in alcohol consumption with uh, uh, approximately nine liters of pure alcohol per capita. That's really a lot. Uh, next slide. And we, and we are looking for the alcohol cause death in, the, in, the, in Europe. We can see that a cancer, alcohol-associated uh, cancer and alcohol-related liver cirrhosis uh, comprise 50% of all the alcohol-induced uh, deaths in Europe. So cancer and liver cirrhosis has really a high impact. Uh, when we are looking a little bit closer, next slide, for, um, to the alcohol attributable, uh, attributable cancer burden in Europe, you can see that um, cancers of the oral cavity, esophagus, um, uh, colorectal, colorectum and of the liver are a very important and have a high prevalence in Europe. And this causes also a, a high uh, life years lost number of 1,880,190. Next slide. Um, it's important to note that the risk for alcohol-related cancer is increasing exponentially with the increased amount of alcohol which is consumed. This is particularly true for cancer of the oral cavity and pharynx. So it's a non-linear, it's an exponential relationship. Next slide. And uh, what are the reasons uh, why is alcohol causing cancer? And this is only one slide, it's a very simplified explanation, but acetaldehyde is the, the main uh, substance metabolized um, uh, from ethanol and acetaldehyde is a carcinogen and damages DNA and proteins and by this causing cancer. Reactive oxygen species, have, they have also a prominent role generated by alcohol consumption and those are highly reactive uh, radicals which are damaging DNA, proteins, and lipids. So basically all, uh, all structures of the cell. Moreover, alcohol consumption leads to a decreased absorption of protective nutrients like vitamins, and at the same time, an increased absorption of toxic substances. So this is also one expl explanation that the combination of alcohol and smoking is very dangerous. So toxic substances are absorbed. Um, there's also a very interesting aspect, the immune system, and it's, it's, there's now abundant evidence that alcohol uh, blocks and impairs the immune system. And the immune system is so important because it, the immune system can detect cancer cells and eliminate cancer cells at an early stage. And of course, also genetic risk factors, individual genetic risk factors modulate the risk for the for the individual person uh, to develop cancer. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, esophageal cancer is important. It's uh, worldwide, it's the sixth uh, largest cancer killer and uh, almost one third of uh, is caused by alcohol. So a lot of patients which we see in clinical practice uh, have a high alcohol consumption. Next slide. 
As I mentioned, the combination of alcohol drinking and smoking is important and particularly important when we are dealing with patients with uh, esophageal cancer. And here it is clearly illustrated that if there is a combination of smoking and drinking, the risk for cancer in the esophagus increases exponentially. Next slide. Alcohol liver cancer, it's a very important, we have many patients. It's a stepwise process. People, patients develop first a fatty liver, then an inflammation of the fatty liver. It's called steatohepatitis or alcoholic steatohepatitis, subsequently cirrhosis, and then uh, uh, liver cancer. Luckily, not all. Uh, next slide. And what is the relevance in Europe? still up to 50% of all the patients uh, with liver cancer has a high alcohol consumption, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the cause of uh, this disease. And um, there are differences in Europe, uh, countries like Scotland, England, Wales, and Finland, they appear to have increased number of alcohol-related liver disease patients. And other countries like France and Italy, there is a reduction in liver mortality. Next slide. Uh, I think colorectal cancer is very important in this context. And why is it important? Uh, all, uh, even a moderate drinking, so even one drink per day, increases significantly the risk to develop colorectal cancer. So if people are drinking four drinks per day, like uh, as earlier mentioned, breast cancer, the risk increases by 50% to increase colorectal cancer. So I think awareness programs have a prominent role because most of the people don't, don't know this. Colorectal cancer is important. It's the second most uh, common cancer in Europe. And the global burden, not only in Europe, but also globally, the global burden is increasing uh, uh, by 60% and will reach 2.2 million new cases, new cases by 2030. So highly important. So let me summarize. I think alcohol and digestive cancers in Europe, there is time for change. It is imperative that immediate action is undertaken by both healthcare professionals and policymakers. So one goal is uh, to increase public awareness of the risk and of course to reduce alcohol consumption in order to reduce also the risk for alcohol related cancers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan, for a very informative overview. Um, we are now happy to give the floor to Maria Danielsson, who is a specialist in public health medicine and senior consultant physician at Ribagatan One, Clinic for Alcohol and Health. Uh, she will talk a bit about alcohol and cancer and how it can be approached from a public health perspective. Maria, the floor is yours. Okay, do you hear me now? Yes. Yes, you can hear me now, good. Uh, okay, uh, as you said, I work nowadays as a physician in Stockholm to help people to reduce or stop drinking alcohol. But before I was working in the field of public health for many years, previously I was responsible for the national health reports in Sweden. And therefore I want to give you a public health perspective on the importance of alcohol for cancer. How important is it? Next slide. I'm sorry, wait, just a moment. Um, as Jitta said, alcohol, uh, that alcohol causes cancer has been well known among researchers for decades. As she said, as early as 1988, WHO recognized that alcohol was a class one cars carcinogen, uh, the highest degree. However, people in general do not know that alcohol can cause cancer. And my experience is that people generally underestimate the health risk of drinking alcohol. Everyone knows that alcohol causes liver damage, but not that alcohol causes common problems as, such as anxiety, depression, sleep problems, high blood pressure, etc., and especially not increased risk of cancer. Even medical practitioners often overlook cancer as a cause of patient's health problem, and do not even ask patient about the alcohol consumption. Next, please. 
Okay, you got that. The most important single risk factor for cancer is tobacco, but alcohol consumption is the second largest. It does not seem to matter what kind of alcohol beverage you drink. It is alcohol, ethanol itself, that is carcinogenic. Next, please. As you already heard, alcohol causes cancer connected to the gastrointestinal tract, starts from the mouth, throat, voice box, esophagus, stomach, liver, and colorectum. These cancers are also caused by tobacco, as already said, and, uh, and that the combination of alcohol and tobacco rises the cancer risk tremendously, manifold. It has been known for a long time that cancers in the upper uh, part of uh, the gastrointestinal tract, like mouth, throat, voice box, and uh, esophagus, are strongly associated with alcohol and tobacco. These cancers are, however, not so common. Now we know that alcohol also increases the risk of one of the most, com uh, most common cancers, namely colorectal cancer. Next, please. Unfortunately, Alcohol also causes breast cancer. And the evidence for causing prostate and pancreas cancer is growing. This is bad news in a public health perspective. Breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and cancer of the prostate are together with lung cancer, the most common cancers in Europe. There are also several other cancers that are associated with alcohol consumption. For instance, lung cancer and melanoma. But the cause of the relationship is much more uncertain so far. Next, please. Alcohol is, of course, only one of many causes to cancer. In Sweden, we estimate that 4.5% of all cancers are caused by alcohol. This slide shows how this figure differs between cancers. For instance, alcohol causes more than 30% of cancer in the mouth and throat. But the largest number of alcohol-caused cancer deaths in Sweden in absolute numbers was colorectal cancer among men and breast cancer among women. Even though alcohol only stands for about 10% of these cancers. You may be thinking, why not concentrate on the, on the causes to the other 90%? We should, if we could. Most risk factors are unknown. WHO estimate that around 40% of all cancers are attributed to a known risk factor. We do not know what causes the remaining 60%. And it is not enough to know the risk factors. We need also to know how we can influence them. For instance, well-known risk factors for breast cancer other than alcohol are women's age at puberty or menopause, age at the first child, the density of the breast tissue, and the height of the woman. Risk factors that are not suitable for intervention, but alcohol consumption can be influenced. Next, please. How much alcohol can you drink without increasing the risk, uh, the risk of cancer? Next, please. Not surprisingly, the more you drink, the greater the risk, as we have seen even ex exponentially. exponentially. This dose-response response relationship differs between cancers. And most important, alcohol causes cancer even at moderate levels. Next, please. This slide shows on the y-axis the excess cancer risk in percentage. On the x-axis, the amount of alcohol a day in grams. 12 grams of alcohol correspond to a small glass of wine and 72 grams a bottle of wine. If you drink a half a bottle of wine a day, you heighten your risk of cancer in the throat, the black line by 140%, esophagus, the dotted line by 60%, breast cancer, the red line by 40%, and colorectal cancer, the green line by 25%. As you see, the excess risks are much higher for cancer in the upper gastrointestinal tract, like the cancer with the throat. These cancers are also very nasty and with poor prognosis. But from a public health perspective, and also from an individual perspective, the overall probability of getting a colorectal cancer and breast cancer is so much higher that even a smaller rise in risk means a lot more in absolute numbers. 
many more people will get colorectal cancer or breast cancer due to alcohol than cancer from the upper gastrointestinal tract. As you can see, excess risk for cancer begins already at a small amount of alcohol. For instance, already one drink a day rises the risk of breast cancer by 11% to two drinks. The excess risk is 23%. Next, please. Swedish drinking guidelines recommends to drink less than 40 drinks per day for men and nine drinks for women. This means that even if you do not exceed the guidelines, you will still have an increased risk of, of cancer. Most people who drink alcohol drink moderately. Therefore, a large proportion of alcohol-related cancer cases comes from the group that drinks moderately due to the size of the group, even though the risk of alcohol-related cancer is much lower than for those who drink a lot. Next, please. In Sweden, we estimate that 29% of alcohol attributable cancer deaths were due to consumption at or below Sweden's recommended drinking guidelines, the blue part of the bar. 42% uh, from people who drank over the guidelines, the middle part, and 29% from former drinkers. This distribution varies from country to country depending on the distribution of alcohol consumption in the population. One conclusion that can be drawn from this slide is that a reduced overall alcohol consumption is important. In order to reduce the incidence of, the can of cancer in the population, since a substantial part of alcohol-related cancer come from moderate drinkers. Next, please. The most effective means to reduce population level of alcohol consumption are to one, maintain and or increase both the floor and the average price of alcohol. Two, reduce the time and places at which alcohol is available for sale. Three, maintain the government's alcohol retail monopoly, if you have one. And four, reduce other ways to procure alcohol, like bringing back alcohol from other countries and home brewing, etc. But as already said, it is also essential to increase the overall awareness of health risk, as we will probably hear, even hear, hear more about later in the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria, for an excellent presentation and a very good transition to um, policy-related um, presentation that's coming right up now. So what we'll be doing is we'll be hearing from Dr. Sheila Gillini. Uh, she is the CEO of Alcohol Action Ireland, um, which is the national independent advocate for reducing alcohol harm. The organization was highly instrumental in formulating a successful passage of the Public Health Alcohol Act 2018, as it's called, um, and the AAI now campaigns for the full implementation of the act. And Sheila will tell you, tell you all about this in the coming presentation. The floor is yours, Sheila. Thanks very much, Kelly. Um, can you see my presentation there okay? Okay, so, Kelly, can you see that presentation okay? No, I cannot. Um... Okay, so I'm screen sharing it there at the moment. But if you want to go back to yours, that's okay. I think, let's try the main presentation, see if sure. we can get it back up. That's okay. So just as uh, Kelly is bringing up the presentation, um, Alcohol Action Ireland um, was very instrumental in trying to bring about uh, a set of um, legislative uh, procedures which was passed in our, our doll in our, our office uh, in October 2018. It was a long time in gestation, but uh, I'll kind of go through that now in a couple of minutes just when it, it comes up. Okay. Are you happy with it there now? You can see it. You can see it. Grant, and if you could just move on to the next uh, slide, please. So as you can see, just uh, moving on to the next slide, um, we have a problem in Ireland with uh, alcohol consumption. As mentioned uh, with earlier speakers, across Europe um, there is a problem and uh, we saw figures there for something like about um, alcohol consumption at a rate of about, 11, or about 9 litres per person, but Ireland's level is even higher, it's up at uh, 11 litres per capita per annum. 
and if you move on to the next slide, and really no matter how you actually measure the harms, whether we're talking about um, the rate of binge drinking or rate of use of alcohol during pregnancy or the amount of money that's spent in our healthcare budget, all our statistics are pretty grim. In this particular case, we, we want to talk about um, alcohol-related cancers. And really, at the moment, around about 900 people annually are diagnosed with, with a cancer that uh, results from alcohol. And if you could move on. And as uh, previous speakers have mentioned, you know, the, 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 uh, the kinds of cancer that are there, they're very unpleasant. And, you know, the thing, though, even though we know this from an academic and a scientific point of view, we see that most people are actually not aware that alcohol is a class one carcinogen. Uh, carcinogen. So uh, in a recent study from uh, in the UK, just 13% were able to identify that alcohol is cancer causing. If we could move on. The, um, uh, the question kind of comes, why does Ireland have such a particular problem with alcohol? And uh, it's really not terribly surprising because if you look at it, we have very low prices for alcohol. There's widespread availability. There is a massive amount of marketing of alcohol. There's a very liberalized economy. And I would say that we have a very influential industry, Goliath, who in, in our opinion would be generating myths, pitted somewhat against uh, a public health David. So there's a massive imbalance really on the, the, the kinds of, um, of approaches that, that are actually being taken. We can move on, thank you. What can we do? Well, uh, what we really want to see is our Public Health Alcohol Act being implemented. We can move on. The aim and object of the Alcohol Act was to reduce the amount of uh, alcohol consumption by using what the WHO would call their best buys. So to reduce uh, the pricing, to reduce the availability, and a very specific thing to, um, to make, put restrictions on the content of advertising. So there is actually um, quite a number of different provisions within the Public Health uh, Act, but I just want to concentrate here on three of them, minimum unit pricing, labelling of alcohol products, and the content of advertising. Next, please. So um, within minimum unit pricing, um, as, as many of you will know, the idea here is to set a floor price beneath which alcohol cannot be uh, sold. And this is incredibly important because of the amount of alcohol which is currently being sold in our supermarkets here in Ireland. And we can see um, from other jurisdictions, Scotland being a very good example of this, next please, that this can be something that really does have an impact. There's actually uh, some figures out this morning, both showing actually public support now for this particular measure, but we've also seen that they, the rate of alcohol consumption uh, across Scotland is now reducing compared with an increase in England and Wales. And then we have seen some early indications that uh, there is a reduction in hospital admissions. So this is something that we are pushing very, very hard to be implemented. A frustrating thing for us is that while we have it in our legislation, it hasn't yet been commenced. We're still waiting. Next, please. Um, in other territories, other, other regions, uh, in Australia, for example, uh, we have seen that when it has been introdu introduced, there have been other positive benefits around, for example, things like reduction in, in assaults and uh, reduction in crashes, road crashes and uh, attendance at, at hospitals. Next, please. Next slide. Thank you. So where are we with MEP in Ireland? Um, at the moment, we've had a series of announcements from uh, our Minister for Health and uh, the previous Taoiseach saying that it was imminent any day now. Uh, we then had a change of government uh, and in uh, June of this year with a, a new government, there was a commitment to actually introduce MEP in conjunction with a similar move in Northern Ireland. This led to the announcement then of a consultation in Northern Ireland um, to be held within the year. And I'd have to say that we would really see this as a delaying tactic, that, is, that there isn't really a need to introduce uh, MUP both North and South at, at the same time. Next slide. So come back to the second of uh, the, the, the measures that, that were introduced. This is about um, advertising. We see this lifestyle myth that basically every occasion is a drinking occasion. And it's very much something that's backed up by a massive uh, global marketing spend of the order of $1 trillion uh, a year. Next slide. So we see unfettered opportunities for, uh, for advertising, whether we're talking about sports sponsorship or sponsorship of um, music events, or just the advertisements that we see popping up on our, our screens on a daily basis. It's just everywhere. Next, please. Next. And just move on. And the next, thank you. 
So what, what the PHAA sought to do was to regulate the content of those advertisements um, so that we weren't just being sold a myth that in fact advertisements should just give specific information about the product, where it's from, the price, description, and taste. But most importantly, the ads must also contain a health warning. And in this case, very relevant to us, it should give a warning that uh, alcohol is cancer causing. Next, please. As well as these advertisements, every alcohol product is supposed to have uh, a label on it with giving a series of warnings. Um, you know, things like uh, the dangers of uh, drinking alcohol during pregnancy, giving information, health information about uh, the number of grams of alcohol, the energy values, things like that. But very specifically to give a warning about uh, the direct link between alcohol and fatal cancers. And this uh, is actually a worldwide legislative first. Next slide, please. But where are we with the labelling? So while the legislation has been passed, we're waiting for what's called the secondary legislation, and that's to give details of the, the, the size of the label, the font, the colour, the positioning. So we're waiting for those uh, regulations to be published. When they are, they then have to be notified to the European Commission for review, and there's a process that follows after that. And then beyond that, when it is actually agreed, there's a three-year transition period before manufacturers would actually have to fully comply. So we are a long way off really uh, having this introduced. And as in, we noticed earlier, labelling is actually linked to our advertising uh, content legislation. So that's delayed as, as well. Next slide. On an international picture, um, the WHO had a very useful report out earlier in the, the year. We're only one in five countries uh, in the European region have legislation around even just the nutritional values, never mind uh, the, the, these additional health warnings. Next slide. Um, a couple of years back ago, there was a very interesting uh, study uh, which was done in the Yukon in Canada where there were labels um, alluding to the, the risks from cancer, from the risks from alcohol to, to cause cancer. Next slide. And one of the things that uh, I, I just thought was so interesting, next slide please, is that um, when the results came out, it was very clear that, that, that it works. The customers actually see the labels, they simply were more likely to remember what the, what the label said than customers at, at comparison stores. The sales of labelled products, they dropped, while the sales of unlabeled products rose uh, over the same period. Now, unfortunately, industry protests at that stage led to those cancer warning labels being abandoned after a few weeks. But it does show you that labelling is something that is, is definitely, it's, uh, it's of use, and it is, I suppose, one of, one of the tools in the toolbox that we need to be employing. Next slide. Um, to give you an example of just sometimes how long these things can actually take uh, to come into play, um, in Australia and New Zealand, uh, legislation was passed uh, earlier in the summer, which um, was about pregnancy warnings. And you can just see uh, from, from what, what was the industry looking for, that was on the, the right hand side of, of the screen, and uh, what, what actually the legislation eventually was able to say on, on the left. Um, so we find that industry tends to use every possible delaying tactic, um, you know, whether we're talking about font or whether we're talking about the colour of, of the labels. Um, we know that there is a battle on our own hands to try and get this legislation through. Next slide. I do want to leave you with a few positives because uh, in Ireland, some of the legislation has now been fully implemented. I'll just flick through the next few. We um, Outdoor ads are no longer uh, allowed uh, near schools or playgrounds. Uh, that came into force last year. At the same time, uh, advertising was banned uh, on public transport. And coming in, next slide, coming in in this November, there would be separation and reduced visibility of alcohol products in, uh, in shops coming in from November 2020. Next slide. So what can we do? Um, we have, I think, this golden opportunity with uh, Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. It's an absolute opportunity for us that we should be putting these preventative measures at the centre. We know what the WHO says can actually work. We've seen it from other countries, the types of, of legislation that, that is of, of use. Most importantly, I just think, as, as other speakers have said, we have a right to know. Um, and just right now, as, uh, as our first speaker noted, that maybe up, to, up as far as 90% of the population don't know that alcohol causes cancer. So let's take this opportunity, let's encourage Europe um, to make the moves to put in place the procedures that are needed to keep our countries safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila.
And um, we're having some trouble getting uh, the commission into this call. Um, so we're going to move a bit in the, in the agenda after hearing from these inspiring developments in Ireland, and we'll move up back to the, to the European level. But instead of moving to the commission straight away, we'll move to uh, Dr. Wendy Jarrett, uh, who is the director of the Association of European Council Leagues, a pan-European alliance of national and regional council leagues created in uh, the year 1980. She has over 25 years experience working in public health and health policy, and will give us a view of the ECL's hopes from the cancer plan with regards uh, to alcohol and cancer. The floor is yours, Wendy. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to Eurocare for involving us in this very, very important webinar. Um, so yes, I would be talking about uh, what uh, cancer leagues want in the beating cancer plan. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So just a few words about ECL. We are this year 40 years old. We were founded in um, 1980. We represent 29 members in the WHO European region. So this is beyond the EU. And the cancer leagues are your national and regional cancer societies um, who work at um, in, in all in, for your government, uh, sorry, for the national population or the regional population. We work across the entire cancer's continuum. So we look at prevention, we look at access to treatment, research, um, treatment itself, patient support, etc. And we are, all the cancer leagues in the countries are the main resources for the general public for cancer control information and services. At ECL, our vision is for Europe free of cancer. Next slide, please. So just a um, small declaration of interest here. We are co-funded by the European Commission with an operating grant, which we have been receiving since 2014. And we also get um, a small support from L'Oreal Gagné through an unrestricted annual educational grant. Next slide, please. These are our focus areas. We provide a forum mainly for members, but also other stakeholders and also the general public. Um, to in order to collaborate with their international peers and we focus on cancer in the area of cancer prevention we help the european commission and the who IARC to promote the messages in the european code against cancer we have um, um, areas we work uh, very actively in the area of access to medicines in tobacco control of course and in patient support next slide please specifically in our work on alcohol. Alcohol is part of our two strategic goals. The first one is on influencing cancer control policies and also um, our second goal on cancer prevention. So we amplify our members' messages um, throughout the year. We raise awareness of the European Code Against Cancer and the Alcohol Cancer Link on social media, especially during the European Week Against Cancer. We've been doing that since 2014. The European Week Against Cancer takes place during the last week of May every year. We provide and we providing the secretariat for the MEPs Against Cancer interest group at the European Parliament. By the way, this, this legislature, we have 130 MEPs signed up due to the important the increasing importance of cancer. Uh, with their help, we organized a meeting, for example, in 2017, and we also support third-party events such as today's event. We regularly collaborate with Eurocare, and we work very closely with our members, especially the Cancer Society of Finland, on the work package on cancer prevention and health promotion within the Joint Action and Innovative Partnership Action Against Cancer, which is taking place um, until end of next year. We are we were a founding we are a founding member along with Eurocare in the previous EU action uh, alcohol and health forum that was chaired by DG Sante, which did include industry representatives and public health NGOs before we exited um, uh, in Exodus along with other health NGOs. But you probably already know that. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to cover, of course, the the cancer. Um, burden with alcohol. You've heard that from our previous speakers already, but I, previous speakers have already mentioned that alcohol is classified by the WHO International Agency for Research on Cancer as a group one carcinogen, but perhaps it's not clear that this means that there is ample evidence, enough evidence that this, def, this is saying that it's definitely carcinogenic to humans. So it's the same classification as tobacco. So it's not among the weaker classifications that such as possibly um, carcinogenic and probably carcinogenic. So I think we need to 
remember that it's classified the same as tobacco, which is more well known. So I just want to cover very briefly on the 12 ways to reduce your cancer risk, which is part of the European Code Against Cancer. Next slide, please. So regarding the particular message on um, alcohol, so there is a, it is message number six. Can I see the next slide, please? Which states, if you drink alcohol of any type, limit your intake, and not drinking alcohol is better for cancer prevention. And if you go to the WHO IARC website, it specifically gives you all the evidence around it. Um, so next slide, please. The link, sorry, go back to the previous one, please. So the message, uh, this message, was developed by leading cancer scientists from around Europe to update the fourth edition of the European Code Against Cancer in 2014, based on the latest scientific evidence on cancer prevention. So this is actually a stronger message than in the previous edition of the European Code Against Cancer, which actually says that if you're a female, then you can drink um, up to two, one drink a day. And if you're a male, you can drink up to one drink a day. and which kind of imply to the general public that it's okay to drink. So that message has now been upgraded in 2014 edition to say that if you drink any al alcohol of any type, you should definitely limit your intake and definitely not drinking any alcohol is better for cancer prevention. Next slide, please. So previous speakers have already mentioned the, the importance of raising awareness. So when it comes to the alcohol and cancer link, there have been various global European national studies looking at ordinary people's awareness of alcohol as a risk factor for cancer. And it showed that awareness is very low internationally. So the, pub, the general public is still very, not very aware of, or maybe more reluctant to engage with this in comparison to tobacco. So you can see here that uh, one in five Europeans don't believe there's a connection between alcohol and cancer due to, um, according to a special your barometer. Nine in 10 Brits don't associate drinking alcohol with an increased risk of cancer. And the European Code Against Cancer does provide simple and clear tool to talk about cancer prevention with citizens and governments, but not everyone is aware of the European Code Against Cancer. So our challenges include how do you encourage behavioral change at the individual level? And how do you affect EU and national public policy to serve people's well-being. Next slide, please. So again, this is in the European Code Against Cancer, but I want to emphasize that in the European Code, for the European Code Against Cancer, while the messages tailor to actions that individual citizens can take to prevent cancer, it also states that successful cancer prevention does require these individual actions to be supported by governmental policies and actions because an individual can take the first step of making its lifestyle changes, but if the policies are not in place to help them do it, then it's much more difficult. Next slide, please. We have um, developed the European Code Against Cancer map. It uh, re was recently launched. It demonstrates the appropriate indicators on the status of implementation and impact of the diff 12 different messages at, at the EU level. And if you go to our map, you will be able to see um, the national efforts in alcohol control. And only 10 of the EU 28, previous 28, have action plans to implement alcohol policy. So please do visit our map if you want some more details at the national, at the country level. Next slide, please. So regarding the Europe's beating cancer plan, um, we have this, um, we have a position paper that was published in February and later on Hannah Horka from the commission, hopefully we'll be covering more about the beating cancer plan, but this is our position paper and all, all members have provided input into this as well as Eurocare. And we emphasize the main governmental actions needed for the implementation of each message within the European Code Against Cancer. Next slide, please. Specifically, what, are the, what do the Euro cancer leagues want? They want the system to support participatory decision-making, social justice and rights-based approach, all in the framework of a health and all policies, systemic thinking, and cross-sectoral cross collaboration. So our leagues are saying that in order to tackle Europe's alcohol problem, we need to better inform cons consumers by improving labeling. So we know that that works. Um, 
our previous uh, speaker has just mentioned that, we need to support the member states by facilitating the adoption of a comprehensive national alcohol control legislation, such as, as you heard, Republic of Ireland's excellent alcohol bill. We need to pro pro prohibit advertising on sports grounds for events. While some countries are already doing this, not all countries are. We need to prohibit alcohol sponsorship of all sports. We need to protect children and young people by restricting advertising and exposure to marketing of alcohol in the digital environment, especially on social media and video sharing platforms, as well as near schools. This is much more difficult um, to implement because how do you control the entire social media platform? Um, on the internet. We all know that that's very, it's a main, a main challenge. Next slide, please. So this is um, in our paper for the European Code Against Cancer, where we do emphasize if you drink alcohol of any type and these are the important areas, alcohol labeling, marketing and advertising, spatial restrictions and fiscal measures and formulation. Next slide, please. And these are just um, some, I just want to conclude with some excellent examples from member societies, our member leagues at the national level. So some are focusing on lobbying for greater legislation, others lead innovative public campaigns. As an example, you can see here, Irish Cancer Society and their allies, uh, they were instrumental in the passage of the public health alcohol bill in Ireland, um, a victory for public health, as was already mentioned, as among other things, includes cancer labeling as a key measure, which was initially faced with fierce resistance, as you can imagine, and you saw, this will ensure that consumers are aware of the risk of consumption and will help establish a social understanding that alcohol is a dangerous commodity. So this was um, due to a lot of work at the Irish Cancer Society and other, stakeho and other stakeholders. The Tournée Mineral campaign um, here done by our, our cancer member, uh, our member in Belgium, called for all Belgians to say no to alcohol in February. So on their website, on the Belgian's website, foundation's website, people can find information, challenge friends, discover alcohol-free recipes, and then see what events they can participate uh, and let people know if they're organizing one themselves. In the UK and Ireland, they have had similar campaigns, Dry January, Dry Asalon. Next slide, please. I thank you very much for your kind attention. And if you have any questions, here are our email. Um, please join us on our Twitter, join Facebook, and LinkedIn, where we post messages, not only at the European level, but also important messages from our cancer societies, cancer leagues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wendy, for, uh, for, um, for a great presentation, truly. We, in the meantime, as you've been speaking in the back here, we've been trying to get the sort of technicality sorted so that the Commission can actually join us. Um, and we'll try some uh, mix between old tech and new tech, and we'll, we'll see how it works. Uh, I'm, hope, I'm hoping we'll get it to work. Uh, as we're getting that set up, I can remind you all that you can ask questions still. Press the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the Zoom seminar, and you will get a question, which will then be asked at the, in the Q&A session, which will follow after the Commission's presentation. We've already got a few questions in, uh, as well as uh, a couple of comments in the chat box, which is, uh, which is already an excellent start. Um, and Hannah is here, I can see. So I'm going to leave it to, uh, to her from the Commission um, to speak a bit about uh, the prevention of alcohol-related cancer in Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. I'm very honoured to give the floor to Hannah Horka, who's the member of the EU Cancer Task Force team, at the Director General for Health and Food Safety in uh, Luxembourg, I think she's based. So hopefully this works. Uh, the floor is yours, Hannah. It seems we still have some issues, but I hope um, Hannah would be with us here in a second. Uh, and now, does it work now? Now it works. Welcome, Hannah. Finally, very, very happy to have you with us. Oh my God, that was, uh, <laughs> that was so, so. Um, 
Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. It was, uh, if I would be a fan of the conspiration uh, theories, I would say that somebody doesn't want to announce uh, how the commissions intend to work on alcohol and cancer. But uh, I don't think so. It was only a problem in the commission within the server. So um, I'm uh, very happy that I can actually uh, be here with you. I'm sorry I didn't hear uh, the previous presentations, which uh, I actually regret very much. And I will talk uh, with the organizers uh, that they uh, inform me what uh, has been discussed. Uh, you know about the European uh, Beating Cancer Plan. I assume that uh, you have already heard about this. Uh, we in Sante were very happy that uh, this uh, became a priority of uh, the commission of um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen when she announced it in her political guidelines, as you see on the first slide. Then next slide, please. Um, then, uh, so uh, we will have a, a plan which will go across the spectrum of uh, the whole uh, lifespan of the disease. So we will really start from the prevention, then early screening, diagnosis, and um, then uh, the uh, whole area after the cancer survivorship, palliative care, uh, the area of the care. So this is a very ambitious plan. Um, we uh, raised a lot of uh, expectations and a lot, um, uh, lot of hope. Uh, I have to say that I, I, I think there will be certainly disappointment because uh, when um, we uh, run the whole consultation process, we really saw the huge uh, need and enthusiasm to tackle all the different issues. But of course, we have to be aware that this is a commission action plan which needs to be implemented together with member states, which are uh, in the key, um, in the centrum actually of the area of the treatment and, uh, of the healthcare, basically. Uh, but, um, uh, however, uh, in the area of the prevention, uh, we would like to focus on the whole area of the lifestyle, um, which actually will not only help to prevent the cancer, but also the other chronic diseases. Uh, so we will uh, tackle the role of the nutrition, physical activity, uh, tobacco and alcohol. Then there will be the issue of the environmental um, uh, pollution uh, and uh, the, then the legislative adjustments in the area at the workplaces, so, so the exposure um, to the carcinogens at the workplaces. And of course, as I have just um, heard um, uh, my predecessor speaking about uh, European Code Against the Cancer, so that will be an important part of the, of, uh, the prevention part, but we will somehow modernize it and update it. I will go very quickly through the next uh, pillars because probably this is not of the interest of today's uh, workshop. But uh, so next slide, early diagnosis, screening, uh, recommendations, update. We will um, make sure whether uh, since the last council recommendations, th there is a new evidence uh, and the science uh, tells us that there is a need to, to update the guide, guidelines. Um, we will also uh, use uh, the artificial intelligence for the screening, so the data, the collection of the big data. So that's the screening. Um, then treatment, improve the access to the treatment, uh, training of the health professionals, uh, specialized centers, um, which um, include the most multidisciplinary teams um, uh, and uh, also the work on the cancer registries, which is very important. Uh, next slide, uh, quality of life and survivors. So um, this is uh, something which is going very much beyond the, the, the healthcare and actually the competence of uh, DG Sante as well. Uh, it will be more the social aspects of the survivorships, uh, help, support to the carers, um, support to, um, or um, let's say, address some kind of the injustice when survivors, people which are in a long, um, 
term remission still need to or still I somehow penalized for the being uh, the ex um, cancer patients and in the access to the financial institution uh, financial loans or uh, mortgages and so on so this is uh, so-called right to be forgotten so this is something which uh, our commissioner is very keen to tackle uh, so, but I go back to the uh, prevention part and the alcohol part, which um, goes, uh, which is of the most interest now to you. So, as I uh, mentioned, our actually, uh, this is our competence. This is the competence of the uh, Commission uh, according to the treaty to support the member state to address uh, the or to, uh, to help to, to uh, prevent uh, the uh, communicable diseases. So it will uh, be um, a mixture of the, or we aim to uh, tackle not only um, soft measures, that there will be also some kind of the, or we hope that we will manage to propose uh, uh, some kind of legislative amendments uh, on uh, tobacco and um, we hope also on the on the alcohol and as i mentioned before there will be also vaccination programs occupational uh, safety legislation um, now about the alcohol uh, harm so um, i i think that i have um, heard right at the beginning that it has been mentioned that there is a um, big um, lack of knowledge that actually there is a strong link between the alcohol and the cancer. So this is something what we would like really to address and we need to find the ways uh, of how efficiently to communicate it. Of course that the European Code Against the Cancer will be one option, however we uh, still need to look for effective ways how to um, improve the awareness about the link uh, relatively strongly between alcohol and cancer. Um, of course that uh, the the, the unique uh, opportunity which we have now with the cancer plan is that uh, this will be a commission action plan. So uh, it will really um, address a different policies, uh, which is uh, what um, we always promote as a health in all policies approach. So we, um, in, in, in connection with alcohol, we would uh, very much uh, like to work with our colleagues uh, working in the um, common agriculture policies and we would address with them or make sure that the coherency, there is a coherency between what they are doing and between what we are doing here in DG Sante. We very much would like to work or we already are planning our work together with colleagues in DG uh, Connect, so the, uh, the, uh, the commission service which is dealing with the um, audiovisual media service directives as, and uh, the whole um, area of the online work and we would like to address the um the the issues of the marketing sponsorship and especially with a particular focus on on the online work because this is something what the member states actually gave us a strong uh, message that this is something what they would like commission to help them to work with and uh, uh, we have already started uh, some time ago to work on the Article 32 of the dire uh, Directive um, on the cross-border uh, purchases of uh, alcohol. So uh, this we would like to um, uh, solve this kind of the problem. This is something that we have already on the table and we would like to work with our colleague in um, Directorate working with the uh, taxation. And uh, uh, yeah, that I mentioned the wine promotion measures and drink driving with the colleagues. Uh, this is something which um, uh, we are working with colleagues in DG Moved. So um, 
transport, working with the transport. I would like here also to mention our ongoing uh, projects, uh, which are which were funded under the health program. We have um, a little bit adjusted them, and we actually uh, adjusted them to our needs uh, to support us in our work for the cancer. So. Um, among other things, uh, there will be um, interesting uh, workshops where we will involve the member states and uh, the aim is to support the member states in um, and gathering the knowledge, capacity building for evidence-based uh, alcohol policies in the areas outside the, the health sector. So there will be an interesting workshop indeed on the marketing, on the online marketing. Uh, that will be the first one which should uh, take place probably still before uh, the end of the year or early uh, next year. The second workshop with member states will address uh, obesity, nutrition and the links to cancer that will uh, take place or um, the, the, the country, leading country is Portugal about the marketing that was Czech Republic. The third workshop will be about the taxation and the cross-border policies. Uh, the hosting country is Lithuania and the fourth workshop will be um, again um, on the policies, agriculture policies and how to ensure the coherence, how to protect uh, the health. That's the fourth workshop and then in Poland we will have a, uh, probably they will be now online so I cannot say that they will, be, they will take On the AFSD, so on the fetal alcohol syndrome. So this is something where um, I would like to also to invite you to whether you and follow our information because there will be a report which will uh, which will uh, follow. Next slide, please. Um, Cancer plan, I should mention the very strong link with the uh, cancer mission. By the way, uh, today, just today, the um, uh, mission board actually handed over to the commission uh, 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 their recommendations about the, uh, the cancer. So this is something where we work with our colleagues in DG research and where we will make sure that there are strong synergies between the EU cancer mission and then the um, uh, European cancer plan. Next slide, please. <clears throat> that I have already uh, touched that um, th it will be the holistic uh, approach and I should also uh, stress that there will be uh, strong synergies with other uh, commission strategies such as farm to fork, the green deal and then the pharmaceutical company for example access to the uh, accessible uh, medicines, cancer medicine and so on. Next slide please. Um, right, so uh, we are actually now uh, in the full work of finalizing the, the, the cancer plan. Um, we have had um, a series of consultations, public consultations, targeted consultation with uh, different stakeholders and we have had uh, through the we have had uh, consultations with the member states and that was uh, through the steering group for prevention and promotion and uh, we have um, asked the member states to reply to our questionnaires so we have a quite detailed overview of what uh, now what the member states would like or how they would like to be supported in the implementation of the cancer plan because of course this is uh, crucial. We can make um, a lot of suggestions on the paper, but what really makes the difference is how we will implement it. And the good news is that uh, we decided uh, to, or we started actually to work on the implementation program, how we will use not only member states, but also all the stakeholders and how 
we, we will involve them in our work. Uh, so this will be still developed, but uh, with regards to the member states, we uh, will establish a subgroup of the steering group on prevention and promotion, and this subgroup will be specially focused on the cancer, on the implementation of the cancer plan. Financial resources, yeah, this is uh, very important, of course. Uh, the discussions, as you may know, are still ongoing. Um, however, uh, even with uh, the reduction of the ambitious commission proposal, we still believe that uh, we will have more resources than, um, than we have any uh, in the previous uh, um, health program. So we are still optimistic that it will be sufficient, uh, we will have a sufficient financing and of course there will be also possibilities in other um, funding mechanism in the Commission such as structure programs and so on. Um, okay, so ne uh, next slide please. Uh, so about the next steps. Um, as I uh, mentioned, we will continue to work with the member states. We finalize now the draft, uh, which will go into the internal commission decision making process. Um, uh, originally, we were uh, hoping to have a discussion in, about the council plan already in the Council of Ministers on the 2nd of December. However, it seems that the situation will change now because there is a, a new uh, package on, on uh, Corona crisis and uh, that's why we will probably postpone the adoption by two weeks. But we still hope that uh, this will, uh, the, that the Council plan will be adopted by the end of the, of the year. And I think uh, that's it from my side. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm very much open to any uh, questions, comments, and um, I hope that um, we will um, hear each other, not for the last time, because as I mentioned, the crucial will be the implementation uh, phase of the of the council plan so um, that we will together work on this that this makes a change in the lives of people thank you very much So thank you, Hannah, uh, for an excellent presentation. And I think I'll leave the the, the floor to Sandra Tricasauras, who will do um, take a, some of the questions that have come in. I can see that a lot of the questions actually have come in. And I can notice that we're at the end of our event. Due to some technical difficulties, I think we'll extend it a couple of minutes so that some of the questions uh, will have time to be answered. Obviously, respecting if any of the panelists or attendees have to leave at the at the time at the time initially stated. But with that, I leave the floor to, uh, to Sandra to go through a couple of the questions that have come in. Thank you. Thank you, Kale. Can you hear me? <laughs> Yes, very well. Yes. Um, so, uh, yes, indeed. Thank you for all the interesting questions. And first, and, and, and um, you know, I just want to say that uh, indeed there's a question um, on uh, the slides. So this event is being recorded and will be um, disseminated through our website at uh, eurocare.org. So org. Uh, so please just check it, and and you will have all the all the event available and the slides. Of course, um, we have so many interesting questions, but I will start by um, a question from Ennio Palmesino from, from Italy, who is representing EBNA, uh, the European Mutual uh, Health Network uh, for Alcohol-Related Problems. And his question is uh, addressed for Hannah Horka. So um, I will just pose it. So Enio is saying, given the link between alcohol consumption and cancer, as consumers, we are wondering why European Food Safety Agency is not taking any steps to inform consumers. So according to uh, Enio, uh, the official claim is we provide scientific advice that helps to protect consumers, animals and the environment from food related risk. 
So where is EFSA in all this? Um, that's the question from uh, Enio. Should I uh, take it now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah. Um, well, um, actually, I don't really exactly know the, the mandate that she should inform. Um, I, I don't think that there is a, such a um, danger which would make a mandate to EFSA to issue any 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 warnings on this. On the other hand, we uh, um, publish the current evidence uh, in the Code Against the Cancer, and I said it will be updated. So I think the information who can, um, for people who want to, to find it, uh, they, they can. So um, I, I think that it is there. Of course, um, we have to be more ambitious how we want to, to present it, but um, I would like also to mention a key point that uh, we share very much responsibilities with the member states in this issue. So it is indeed um, up to them uh, how they decide to address the alcohol. We, were, uh, we know that they are member states uh, that have very strict measures in place and how they regulate uh, the access to the um, uh, to the alcohol and uh, how they protect the minors or young people. Some other member states are more benevolent. So we should um, actually our role as a commission is to support the member states in in the measures which they decided to apply. So it is not our role to um, yeah to ban alcohol or to uh, to to have any kind of uh, strict warnings about this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. There are several questions for you. So I will take just uh, briefly the, the question from um, Tom Defilé, um, who is also um, wondering about is the Commission planning on legislation on a common minimum age in the EU? And uh, he he's uh, I mean Tom um, is asking from the Center of Expertise on Alcohol and Other Drugs VAD. Yes, well I I wouldn't like to get into the discussion uh, what exactly will be in the plan, uh, mm -hmm. so uh, I don't want to go into the details. But um, as I as I mentioned um, before, we are uh, rather. In, in terms of alcohol, there is a strong difference between uh, how we work on the tobacco control and on alcohol uh, control. So while there is a rather um, big uh, consensus that uh, we should uh, together in the EU work uh, towards um, tobacco-free Europe, there is no this consensus uh, about the alcohol. So uh, we have to be realistic and as I said, we have to support those member states who wish to um, have uh, stricter measures and uh, um, it's done on the kind of the voluntary, voluntary basis. We don't really um, want to yeah, to be paternalistic and to tell them what uh, they have to do or what they should do. Okay, thank you for, for the answer. We have another comment from uh, Niklas uh, Christensen and, and he's raising on the, on the presentations uh, regarding the link between alcohol and, and cancer. But he notes that we have also heard what policies uh, need to be put in place uh, to reduce alcohol consumption. Um, he thinks that a lot of the policy makers know about this, but a big problem is the alcohol industry, according to him, and the loving. Uh, from the industry. So how should we address this problem? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a question. Uh, you know that a Commission actually, um, the, the, the approach of the Commission is uh, reduce uh, the, the harm, so work on the reduction of the harm. So we really uh, want to uh, support or to work with the industry in the way that if they want to go through the self-regulation, if they want really, as they declare, to help us um, 
um, to reduce the risk, uh, especially for the miners. So they should work on this in their core businesses. So which means on the, uh, on the marketing, on the accessibility and so on. We certainly don't want to get into the discussions with the industry about the health uh, impact of alcohol. So we don't want to, them to disseminate any messages how much is harmful and what is harmful and what is not. So we don't, uh, again, in comparison with, with the tobacco, we uh, don't exclude them to, um, we want to work with them on, in the areas, which is their core business that uh, they help us to reduce the alcohol related harm. Thank you. We have also an interesting uh, note from uh, Eric Carlin at WHO um, and he's uh, also uh, thanking presenters for, for their, their presentation. So, and, and he would like to emphasize that the links between any drinking levels and cancer and he insists on, on the best buys uh, that are vital to prevention alongside with screening and early inter intervention and it has been uh, said uh, for instance like individuals at risk and how do panelists I think that we can provide information so that people can change their behaviors if necessary and also very important without stigmatizing individuals um, probably women are at risk uh, of that I don't know who would like to take this, uh, this question. I keep also other panelists to speak because I see sure, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Hannah. Yeah. Uh, if perhaps I could come in there. Um, so one thing that I would say, and I agree in, entirely about the need not to stigmatize people about their individual drinking, and it would be very much an alcohol industry approach, is to try and put the emphasis back on the individual. So the way in which we can actually overcome this is to take public health measures. So the things that work in general work for them for specific groups. So if we try to reduce alcohol consumption by means say of pricing, particularly around and advertising, that will, the overall, if we overall reduce the level of consumption, it will particularly also then work in particular groups like women, for example, where there's safe concerns about drinking in, in pregnancy. Um, and I was very pleased to see um, uh, their speaker from the, the commission, you know, talking about health needing to be in all uh, policies uh, that should be should be included there. Um, I would have a little bit of concern, you know, in the top line thing that the promotion of a healthy lifestyle. Um, I'm just bearing in mind that uh, the global alcohol industry has a as a marketing spend of the order of one trillion dollars annually. So I think any small approaches about you know um, promoting a healthy lifestyle while while useful and I'm certain not saying we shouldn't do it. We should bear in mind that these will be minuscule against the size of a marketing budget which encourages alcohol consumption. So really what is needed are curbs on that marketing budget and the amount and the myths, the lifestyle myths that, that are, are, are portrayed. Very good. Thank you, Sheila, for, for this question. I'm afraid the time is, is running very quickly. So um, uh, I would just pose uh, another question and, and then I'll give the floor to, to Marianne Scar from Eurocare. Um, uh, so the question is again uh, to the Commission, to, to Ms. Horka. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee. So what are the possibilities to ensure funds under the health program for smaller civil societies, organizations in Europe to fight alcohol harm in their societies through European partnerships? Yes, so this is actually a question rather for uh, my colleagues working in the uh, agency in the Shafia because they are managing the, the health program. So I know that they are uh, or they have been uh, uh, funding possibilities for, for the NGOs. And I'm not, uh, uh, and, you know, uh, the, the, the discussions about the new health programs are not yet over, so I'm and I'm not entirely in it, so I wouldn't really like to 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 comment on this too much because uh, yeah, that's not my field. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Horka, and thank you all the panelists, and, and thank you all, all the questions, all the people who who sent us questions. Please do not hesitate to contact us if you have any any other 
um, questions and I will try to get back to you. I see that from the chats uh, some questions have been already uh, responded by, by our colleagues uh, but I'll give the floor to Marianne Scar uh, for final remarks uh, from the um, head uh, from our office here in, in uh, Brussels. So uh, Marianne the floor is yours. Thank you very much Sandra. And I have to say thank you very much everybody. It's been really engaging and interesting to listen to. And I'm very proud that we had almost 200 uh, registered for the event and around 140 of you have been listening throughout the, throughout the hours. And I see that we could have kept on for much, much longer. But it's good to know. And I especially want to thank our host, Jutta Gutland. Uh, Jutta, you have been a warm supporter and a voice for public health in the last uh, parliament and uh, continuing. And it's really good to have you on board. It's highly appreciated and I, it's difficult to thank you enough for your uh, warm support, but we do. We are very happy to have you on board. And also, of course, a very warm thank you to all the speakers who have been taking the time to share your knowledge with us. Uh, we need you all very much. Our target audience for this event was actually the European institutions and the member states, the decision makers. As we are now finalizing or going towards the end of the finalizing the European beating cancer plan. Uh, we need every single of your voices to call to the member states and the institutions to ensure that we actually have a space for uh, alcohol prevention in it. There are some encouraging news. I saw what Hannah Hocker presented to us and we really want to ensure it, that it stays in. We all agree on, we are calling for specific message, uh, measures related to prevention of alcohol related cancers. We need allocation of funding for information campaigns. We need better data. The EU should legislate where it's very well placed to do so on commercial communication, especially in the digital area, the labeling of health messages. At uh, Eurocare, we've been calling since uh, the last 10, 12 years for health messages. They have to rotate. It cannot be just one message on the bottle because we don't see it any longer. The health messages have to continue and they have to rotate and this should be taken at an EU level. And we should build on the work that's done as being done to, uh, to reduce non-communicable diseases. And that's the three best buys that's already been mentioned uh, from WHO. The price, the, uh, the marketing and the availability, they are very central for the work and that's going to be done and move forward. I actually want to end this uh, seminar with the words from Jutta Gutland. She was saying that there is very clearly a lack of knowledge in Europe and that the citizens have the right to make informed choices. I think that is the best ending we can have and we look forward to continue this discussion in the months and the years to come. Thank you very much every single one of you and uh, hope to see you soon live and in person <laughs> instead of online. Thank you.